Hey guys, it's Wes from CG Cookie. Thanks for joining on this live stream. We are here from Sculpt Cookie. I have Jonathan Williamson here with us. He's going to spend about an hour talking about sculpting portraits in Blender or even you know general sculpting topics. With these live streams, uh, I will be moderating. Jonathan will be doing a bit of talking, do a bit of demoing, and what you can do is ask your questions on the right hand side. Vote them up, what you'd like to see answered, and uh, I'll present those over to Jonathan. So, take it away, Jay. Cool. Well, again, thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, this should be a bit of fun. Um, like Wes said, basically what I'm going to do is just talk a little bit about um, kind of the sculpting workflow and whatnot that I've been exploring in Blender. Um, as some of you may have seen on, if you follow me on Twitter or if you've been watching the Sculpt Cookie Gallery or anything like that, um, I recently started a challenge for myself that is really... Um, it's purely a personal kind of artistic challenge of sorts, which was to sculpt a single portrait a day for 30 days. Now, you know, I haven't completely uh, succeeded in adhering to the full 30 days thing. Uh, I'm actually a few days behind. Um, but that, that's okay, because I'm still getting there. But right now, I think so far in the last 10 days or so, I've done about seven portraits. And basically, the goal is to spend an hour or two each day just sculpting a portrait. So it's it's pretty loose. Uh, it's not meant to be a perfect representation of, say, the person that I'm sculpting from because I'm always working with a little bit of reference. Um, and, and yeah, so the goal is just to basically push myself further artistically in a way that allows me to, you know, just get more and more comfortable with sculpting. Because one of the things that I've noticed recently is that I definitely felt like I was kind of neglecting my my sculpting. You know, I've been doing just a bunch of other stuff. And so I wanted to kind of get back to it. And one of the things that you really find with sculpting, and I think this applies to all art, is if you don't do it every single day, you you lose it pretty quickly. Now, it comes back quickly. You know, you once you learn it, you kind of have it for life, but you definitely are are rusty, you know, and for me, I was really, really rusty. So this was a way for me to kind of explore it and become, you know, re-familiarize myself with everything with sculpting, with the human head, everything. So, first of all, um, if, Wes, can you see the, see the screen now? Mr. Westbrook? Sorry about that, yeah. Yes. <laughs> okay, I just wanted to help the stream, I'm out of here. <laughs> I want to make sure I wasn't going to demo anything before uh, anyone could see anything. So, first of all, I mean, a, a, a note of warning of sorts. I, I am not a master sculptor by any means, and I most definitely do not have perfect anatomy. I make all sorts of mistakes. Uh, if you look at my gallery on Sculpt Cookie, there's all sorts of problems with the sculpts. But that's completely aside the point, because the point is not to create perfect realistic portraits, you know, yes, that is a goal of sorts, you know, to obviously with every single one to get better anatomy, get better forms, get better surface treatment, you know, all those things, but the goal is is progression. And even in the seven that I've done so far, you can already see progression uh, within the portraits from beginning to end. And so that's kind of the, the point, just kind of some of what I want to talk about today. And so what I'm going to go ahead and do is just start... Um, I, I don't have any references up at the moment because I am working on a single monitor and I'm actually traveling. I'm at, at my brother's house at the moment, so I don't have my normal workstation. Um, so this will be a little bit a little bit looser, but I want to go into some of the workflow that I use within Blender for doing these very quick sculpts. They're very loose and don't rely on a lot of specific tools. You know, you can really use any tools that you work. So the first thing that I do is I always sculpt from a polysphere. And a polysphere is nothing more than a subdivided rounded cube that has been smoothed to form a sphere. Easiest way to do that, add in a subdivision surface modifier. Oops. Subsurf. I put the levels up to two, just give me something basic. Sometimes I might go to three or so. And then I'll simply click apply, hit tab to go right into edit mode. And let me turn on my screencast key so you can see these. There we go. And turn them on down here. They are not showing. Oh, there they are. Move them over here. There we go. OK, so then once I'm in edit mode, I just hit, bring up the space bar, and I type in two sphere, 
which will give me a spherized command, so I can just make sure that it's perfectly round. It doesn't have to be perfectly round, because we're going to be sculpting on it anyway. Um, and then I just go back to, to sculpt mode, and we're going to work exclusively with dynamic topology. Well, not exclusively with dynamic topology, um, but primarily with it, because what we want is we don't want to spend a lot of time creating a very specific measured out object. You know, if we wanted to get an absolutely accurate portrait or a perfectly perfect piece of anatomy, you know, we could spend a lot of time measuring the exact width of the skull the, from front to back, the eye sockets, everything. But what we want to get is quick artistic, artistic expression. So using dynamic topology is perfect for this. So I'm just going to enable dynamic from the toolbar. And then we're just going to start sculpting. And also, generally, I work with symmetry for the first half of the sculpt. Uh, the reason being that when you're just getting in the main structure, it's really nice to work with symmetry because it ensures that you've got things you know, consistently placed across the x-axis. Uh, once we get a little further along, then I'll generally turn symmetry off so that we can get a sense of naturalism and imperfection to the sculpt that really helps kind of ground it in reality. So what I like to do, once I have my, my sphere ready, is literally just kind of start pushing and pulling the shape. Um, I'll use the clay strips brush, the snake hook brush, and the draw brush primarily, but really not too much. You know, what I'm looking for is just a basic skull shape, and so this is one thing where it's really, really helpful to have some anatomy models on hand for quick reference. Uh, myself, personally, I have a couple of different skulls, a couple of different skeleton models that just sit on my desk that make it really easy for me to just kind of look at. Um, you know, it, it definitely helps to, to know your anatomy and kind of know what the basic structures are and such, but having something just right on your desk, even when you are pretty familiar with something, is really, really beneficial. And so, you know, just going in here, trying to get the basic skull, and note that I'm... You know, when I say the skull shape, I literally mean the skull. Generally, for most of these portraits, what I've been doing is I will actually sculpt, you know, the majority of the skull itself, including the, the cranium, the jawbone, everything. And then after that, I will go in and actually, actually just fill in the voids to give me the rest of it. And the reason that I like doing this is it allows me to basically ensure that my structure is good. Uh, and because once you have the, the the structure down, everything else just kind of falls in place, you know, because everything about the human face, whether it's the shape of the nose to, you know, the curve of the brows, the, the you know, the prominence of the cheekbone, whatever it is, all of it relies on the shape of the skull. And so if you get your skull shape in first, then everything else just kind of works. Um, and so this is definitely an area where it's good to spend a fair bit of time, become comfortable with the overall shapes, and it's definitely something that I'm, you know, spending every single day practicing on, uh, but it definitely makes things a lot, lot easier. And okay. so... <clears throat> now, Jay, yeah. On that subject, you know, we had a question from Ken Chamel saying, after sculpting so many heads, is there a particular facial feature that you least are kind of looking forward to? Did you know, doing like, oh, uh, you know, uh, I really enjoy the jawline, actually. Um, you know, because the, the jawline is one of those things that it's, it's hard to get right, I think, but it can really, you know, say a lot about the type of character that you're doing. Um, you know, if you give somebody a very square, rigid jawline, you know, it can be everything, it can mean a lot of different things, you know, depending on how you present it. Uh, it can be everything from a very rugged character, you know, like if you're going for like an old grizzled cowboy or something like that. Um, at the same time, you know, if you look at people like uh, Olivia Wilde is somebody that comes to mind, the actress, who has a very strong square jawline, and yet at the same time, it's very feminine. And so I think, I think it's just a really interesting detail in that it's, it's hard to get right, I think, and it's very easy to, you know, like if you're trying to create a very delicate form to make it really strong and then something just looks wrong. Um, I don't know, I also like the shape of it because it's something that, you know, it frames the rest of the face for the most part. And yeah. so it's, yeah, I don't know. I, I guess that would be my, the main detail that I really like. I'm starting to you enjoy doing... Do you have a detail doing... that you dislike or, or 
Uh, I actually talk, I talked to Kent about this uh, a couple of weeks ago. I, I don't like doing uh, lips. I'm not any good at them. Um, I struggle with them on every single sculpt that I do. Uh, you know, I've, I've done a bunch, and I swear they don't get any easier. <laughs> They're all hard. Um, one thing that I... Uh, well, I just will say, too, just a reminder to everybody, is, as you're watching the stream, feel free to post your questions on the right. Jonathan is be, uh, sculpting a portrait here, but we'll also, uh, mainly towards the end, we'll be able to answer a bit more of your questions. Yeah, and, um, I mean, Wes, if you want to, anytime that there's a, a question, you know, feel free to shout out. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't mind trying to answer them while I'm sculpting. I, I cannot guarantee that the sculpt is going to come out in any kind of attractive <laughs> form. I'll be able to nudge you while you're mid-sculpt of the, the <laughs> lips, right? But that, that is actually, you know, that brings up a note. Um, you know, that's one of the, the things that I think can be really good while also quite frustrating with sculpting. I, I Personally, I like it, um, but it's one of the things I think you really want to be aware of is that most portraits, you know, whether you're recreating an exact person, whether you are creating somebody from memory, whether it's completely imaginative, you know, whatever it is, most portraits of any kind look like crap for 90% process. Um, and I think, you know, I think that's pretty common in a lot of things, you know, even in architectural modeling, in character modeling, in vehicle modeling, you know, it, it all kind of comes down to what you're doing, but also to having a very selective eye for understanding when something is working and when something's not. Um, one of the, the workshops that I took a few months ago, this was a class out in San Fran that I went to that was just fantastic, uh, hosted by Anatomy Tools. One of the things that we talked on a lot during that workshop um, that was a really good learning experience was really seeing basically how much of just the shape of your, your sculpt, so like your silhouette and things like that, um, how much of that has a direct impact on the likeness of a sculpt. And so in this case, in this class, we were working from a live model. So we had a, you know, there was a guy there that was uh, a live model posing for us every single day. And as we started getting towards the end of the class, we would be uh, trying to capture his likeness. And in this case, the instructor, his, his name is Andrew Kars, uh, gave a demonstration by just, he walked up to just one person in the room, I don't remember who, and basically took their sculpt that looked, at the time, looked absolutely nothing like our model, uh, and just made, th like, th I think in this case it was like three changes with like three strokes of the knife, and immediately it just clicked that that was a portrait of the model. And, you know, basically all he did that really nailed it was ensuring that the shape, the primary shapes of the head were correct. Mm -hmm. And correct in the sense of, you know, accurate to the model. And so in this case, the shapes that he was looking at was things like this profile right here, the jawline, and then from the side, the slope of the forehead, and the shape of the nose. Like, those were the only things he changed. And literally, he did it in less than 30 seconds. And it took it from being just a generic head to being the model. It was, you know, one, it was an astounding demonstration of what somebody who really knows their craft can do in just, like, you know, three key, you know, the equivalent of three keystrokes. Um, but it was also just, you know, I think, I know I'm guilty of this, and I suspect a lot of people are, in that when we, we go to create, say, like, you know, if you're sculpting Sean Connery or, you know, any other well-known figure, you'd spend so much time doing the specifics, you know, trying to get the bridge of his nose just right, getting the shape of his lips just absolutely perfect. Yeah, I was going to interject. We just got a, received a, a question as well. Any tips for sculpting portraits from reference? So, example, sculpting Andrew Price to get it just right. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, that's exactly this. You know, focus on the overall shapes. You know, look at the, the angle. In this case, in the case of Andrew, look at the an angle of Andrew's forehead. Look at the angle of his, his jaw. You know, does he have a very skinny face, round face, oval face? Look at those kind of big, big picture things, and if you get those right, then the little details are simple. You know, because your your little details, like you know, does you know, do the lips have a slight turn up at the end, or are they slightly down, or you know, are they very thin lips or uh, voluptuous lips? You know, whatever those small details are, 
those are very small, minute things that are basically nothing more than you know what we might call the trim work on a house. If you can get the big t details in, then you can capture that likeness pretty quick. Um, you know, this is actually something that uh, Kent demoed really well in one of his other courses, uh, his course on uh, sculpting caricatures, uh, where he actually sculpted my brother, uh, was a great demonstration of this because you know, with a caricature, you're you know, if you put on say like really big lips or really small eyes or something like that, you know, obviously those details are no longer even remotely accurate, and yet it still looks like the person, and it's because those overall shapes are correct. Um, they may be exaggerated, but they're correct. Nice. Uh, a, a next question that is getting a lot of vote ups. It's being dug a lot. If you weren't the head of Blender Cookie, would you use programs like Mudbox or ZBrush or even Sculptress? Well, I mean, I guess I, I do um, a little bit. Um, <laughs> even even being quote unquote head of Blender Cookie, I still do do a little bit. Um, I don't use them on a regular basis, um, but I have used them in the past. Uh, they're Frankly, great applications. Yeah, we've used uh, Sculptress quite a bit, and right, we've that one. That uh, was... No, we never used Sculptress much. Um, we had Mudbox for a while, and we're actually using it for some things. Um, never spent too much time with it. Um, you know, honestly, I, I I continue to stick with Blender because of the the community, but also because I actually just really like it as a software. Um, but that doesn't negate the the other packages that are also very very good. They're also very different. Um, you know, I would say that actually Mudbox is pretty darn similar to Blender. Um, you know, as far as like the way that it works, its functionality, it's fairly similar. You know, ZBrush is probably the most unique of all sculpting packages, I would say. Yeah, yeah, definitely. No, I know another uh, hot question was, you know, do you have any tips on transforming, you know, Basically, from 2D to 3D, if you're looking at a flat reference, uh, what are some key things to keep an eye out for to make that translate into the 3D space? Uh, I mean, those things, that's always really hard to get to get right. Um, I would say, again, I mean, it's kind of the, you know, beating the dead horse, kind of the same one. Um, you know, focus on the the profiles, focus on getting the, the silhouettes and the overall forms right, because... Again, if you can capture the the overall shape, you know, in this case I'm going to say the, the feeling. If you can capture the feeling of the thing, it really doesn't matter if the individual details are ac accurate or not. Um, you know, that's one of the things you see a lot in basically adapting a, a 2D design to 3D. Presentation is generally just overly optimistic and probably is not going to happen. You know, for for whatever reason, and so again, if you can capture the, you know, I don't want to say the the essence of the thing, but you know, stupid manipulator, um, but you know that that is what it is. If you can capture that essence, then then you're golden. Okay. Um, you know, that as to like actually that. how to do that, you know, that's going to depend a lot on you know the specifics of what you're working on. All right. Well, the, on this, uh, if you're on the questions, you notice that I did click the wrong button, and uh, the, so I'll just go into the the question that I did say you were answering. Do Do you think we would get an automatic retopo tool like ZMesher one day for Blender? Um. Uh. I I don't think it's real likely. Um. Personally, while I've never actually used um, ZMesher. I'm skeptical of its benefit in a lot of workflows. I think that, you know, th that's not to mean that it doesn't have benefit because it most absolutely does. You know, it's like I've watched videos of it and it's just mind boggling. Um, you know, it's an incredibly powerful, cool thing. But I question how good it is in terms of actually making, say, like an animation friendly model. Like to me, it seems like an amazing thing uh, to do. Like, if you want to quickly remesh a sculpt in order to do a detail pass or something like that, um, you may hear my dog whining in the background. That you, um, so for that, I think it's probably incredible. Now, I would love to be proven wrong, so if anyone has extensive experience with that and you know wants to show it being used for an animation-friendly model, that would be sweet. Um, but from what I've seen of it, in most cases... You know, when they talk about making an animation-friendly model, you know, with good topology and things like that in Z remesher, what I see is not automatic remeshing, 
but guide-driven remeshing, where they're basically you know able to go in and say, cool, I want the topology flow like this, like this, like this, and you know they're able to put in guides that then tell it how to generate the mesh, and that's really not automatic retopology. That's just really fast, awesome retopology. <laughs> um, but that's honestly that's the kind of thing we're working towards with contours. You know, it's it's a slow process. There's a lot to do. It's it's not easy. Um, there's not very many people out there that understand the math that goes into something like that. Um, I most certainly do not. I don't know how pa how Patrick does it. <laughs> Patrick, who is the code voodoo? Developer. Yeah. <laughs> So at this point in the sculpt, you know, you notice it, it's starting to get a little messy. There's starting to be some semblance of, you know, features and things like that. Um, I'm trying to be pretty loose about it, though, and so I'm not spending too long on any one feature. You know, it's very easy to get sucked into, say, like, you know, getting the lips absolutely perfect, um, and I'm very guilty of this all the time because I'll say, ooh, those are starting to look really good, so I'm going to keep working them, and then I work on them, and I work on them, and I work on them, and then I zoom out, and I realize, oh, crap, the shape is completely wrong, uh, and then you you basically lose everything. Uh, and so what I'm trying to do at this point is, you know, spend, spend a little bit on the nose, spend a little bit on the eyes, spend a little bit on the lips, and most importantly, spend some time looking at the cohesion between all of those pieces. You know, are the are the lips in the right place? Are the eyes in the right place? You know, how does it align with the, you know, the corners of the mouth? You know, do the corners of my mouth line up with the inside of the pupils or the inside of the iris, which it pretty much does right now, so it's about right. Um, same thing, like, the inside of the eye to the outside of the nose is about right. Um, does the brow down to the cheekbone just about past the eye? Uh, right now it does not, so my eye is likely a little too far back. Um, you know, which is one of those things that <laughs> anytime you see somebody that has, um, oftentimes in movies you'll see people sculpt a character or create a character that has this big old slash across their eye, you know, like this or like that or something, and yet their eye is totally intact. Um, that basically can't happen in reality because if you have a slash that goes across your eye like this, your eyeball's gone. Like, it's, you've got a slash across your eyeball. Um, you know, unless somebody just decided to go and say, I'm going to nick your eyebrow, and then I'm going to nick your cheekbone. Uh, part of, so like, you like movie magic. Yeah, yeah, part exactly. of movie magic has been ruined for you every time you see, like... Uh, yeah, yeah it actually really like, has. <laughs> but it's cool, because it, may, it gives you a great anatomy landmark, because you can go in and say, hey, cool, do I have a nice, you know, basically line across here? Sweet, that works. So, you know, that that's kind of nice, but... but yeah, you're right. a, there was a, a question earlier. Are you using a, a trackball? Uh, if so, are you comfortable with it? Or <laughs> No, I hate them. What, uh, <laughs> you're not comfortable with it then. But uh, no, uh, the second part of the question is, what lens of your viewport? Um, generally, I, I, okay, so right now the lens is 35. Um, normally I work at 50, and actually I'm glad you mentioned that because I will change that. Um, 50 is pretty close to reality in the sense of how we see things through our eyes, and so I think that's a good, good lens to sculpt at because that way you know, it's as if they're standing next to you or in front of you or whatnot, whereas if you're working at, say, like, 35 or 15, you're looking through a distorted image, basically, and you're going to have a, a much harder time getting everything to look correct. Um, as far as the trackballs, no, I, I don't work the trackball. I'm working with a tablet right now, um, and I work... When I'm sculpting, I work basically exclusively with a tablet. Sometimes, if I'm tweaking proportions, I might work with my mouse, um, just because sometimes the grab brush is a little weird with um, pressure sensitivity. Yeah, um, we had so uh, can... another question asking, you know, is there a way to rotate around the model with a tablet instead of using the mouse wheel? Uh, to rotate around the model? Right. Uh, well, I mean, you can, as long as you've got rotate around selection on, um, then it works just like you're rotating with a mouse. So, like, what I, use, what I do for my tablet is I, um, I turn on emulate three-button mouse, and so basically, uh, and I also set one of my buttons to be a middle, uh, middle click, and so one of the, the pin buttons is a middle click, so it acts just like a mouse. Um, and then, obviously, when I, when I press down on the tablet, that's my left click, and then the other uh, thumb button on the pin is my right click. Um, a, if you've ever, if you're struggling with with navigating around your model in 3D, 
Um, you might try one of the 3D Connection Space Navigator mice. Um, they're, they're not great for all purposes, but they actually work very nicely with a, with a tablet to allow you to, to navigate um, very easily around your model. Basically, you keep one hand on the you know, Space Navigator or whatever the 3D mouse is that you're using, and then or maybe switch your hand between the Space Navigator and, and your keyboard. Uh, works works pretty nicely. I don't know that it's the fastest workflow, but it can certainly, you know, if you're having trouble navigating, that can yield some some very nice control. Okay. Uh, another question that's being voted up quite a bit. You kind of touched on this a little bit earlier, but how would you compare the Blender Sculpt tools to Sculptress uh, that uh, this person finds it easier to use? Um. Honestly, I think they're really similar. Uh, I I do think Sculptress has a much better grab tool. Um, the the sculpt the grab brush in Blender, even though we've tried to improve it, it's just it's kind of wonky, um, particularly when using pressure sensitivity. You know, because like if I go in here and I do this, like it's it's hard to get a nice smooth fall off. I guess like I don't know. It's it just seems like it's really hard to control perfectly. Um, but as far as the other brushes, you know, most things are pretty darn similar. You know, our dynamic topology is very, very similar to the way that it works in Sculptress. Um, yeah, I, admittedly, I haven't used Sculptress in uh, probably like a year and a half aside from quickly opening it. So it may have changed, although my understanding is Pixelogic is no longer developing it. I don't know if that's true. Maybe somebody else can chime in on that. Yeah, I'm not sure, because they definitely, the, the creator was, uh, works for Pixelogic now. Yeah, well, I mean, Pixelogic bought it and then right. are continuing to release it. I don't know if they have continued to, to do that or not. Yeah. So, yeah, if someone's here, they uh, could chime in on the comments or uh, the post, because we'll, we'll post the, the live stream on Sculpt Cookie and see if we can get a, an answer to that. Now, when you're sculpting right now, are you constantly thinking uh, like anatomy, actual you know human anatomy, the underlying structures? Yeah, most definitely. Um, and in fact, like I'm trying to constantly remind myself to ignore the detail, ignore the detail, ignore the detail, because my you know the anatomy is not perfect yet. Um, and so I want to be be constantly going back and checking. You know, how does the how's the jawline look? You know, how's my spacing from you know how's the size of the ear? Is the size size of the ear to the jawbone correct, which right now actually it's not. This actually needs to be a little lower. Um, one of the things, like basically the space from the targus to the, the bottom of the jawbone is basically the same length as it is from the targus to the top of the ear. Um, not necessarily from the ear lobe, you know, because people have very varying sizes of ear lobes, you know, particularly in, in older men, or in, if you've got a detached ear lobe versus an attached ear lobe. Uh, but basically, this distance is about the same as this distance. Then also, you've got your basically the top of the eye to the top of the ear, bottom of the nose to the bottom of the ear. So actually, my ear is a little large. So there's like I'm I'm doing things like that constantly, um, and and actually I will I will continue to do that up until the very very end. And now, of course, you know, the neck that I started to, to extrude is <laughs> all sorts of wonky. Right. We're basically like, you know, most of the time I'm trying to focus on the big picture, not the little picture, because if you say like, you know, if you start doing what I did and, you know, do the, do the neck really quickly and then you walk away and spend all your time on the lips and make, you know, an absolute perfect facial details or something like that, and then you zoom out, the neck is just going to throw everything off. Yeah. Uh, and so... While, you know, it's okay to just, you know, quickly pull out an arm or pull out a, a leg or, you know, depending on where, I, I wouldn't pull out a leg at this point, obviously, but uh, it's just, I think it's a good idea to be constantly looking at everything. So, like, since my, since the neck is all sorts of wonky right now, I want to spend a little extra time on that neck and on the shoulders and things like that to ensure, basically, to bring it to a natural feeling state such that it's not throwing off everything else. Another question is, do you have any tips for getting a nice, clean result from the crease brush? I've had many sculpts where it would work decent in certain areas, but never really 
have a nice clean crease even with smoothing or other tweaks. There we go. Um, yeah, well, it depends on what you're using the crease brush for. Uh, I use the crease brush a lot. I really like it. Um, but it really kind of depends on what you're doing. So, for example, like um, I'll use the crease brush to, say, put in a small wrinkle within the skin. Or I might use the crease brush to uh, help define a nice hairline. Um, I might... I, I actually use the crease brush a lot in reverse, where you know I'll have it pull up instead of push in, uh, and that works really well for a lot of things. And as far as getting a clean result from it, uh, use it in low strengths and don't use too much pinching. So, for example, with the crease brush, we have the pinch option, which by default is at 0.5, and that's generally where I leave it. You know, I don't do a whole lot, uh, but also you know use it carefully you know so like I might use it right now if I hold down control to basically put it into add mode during the stroke it will pull out which makes it really nice for getting like defined lines so I might use it for if I turn down the strength a bit I might use it for defining the the jaw structure right in here you know the cheekbone I might use it between the the mouth here um, I'll use it a bit on like the top of top of the lips or to punch in the bottom lip um, I'll use it, uh, you know, I might define the bottom of the nose a little bit more. So generally I use it to, like, define the edge of a plane. Uh, but once I start getting into really fine detail, I still use the crease brush, but I turn its strength way, way down, and, you know, generally I'll turn the pinching off as well, because at that point I don't want it to pinch things together. I just want the you know, the, the shape of, that the crease brush gives, which you can also simply do by using, like, a draw brush, you know, or the regular brush, and just change it to a sharp profile in the curve. You know, that also works very so well. So do you have um, uh, a set of tools or brushes that you typically will use on a portrait? I mean, pretty much I use... The clay strips brush is my absolute best friend. I love that thing. Um, I, I've started using just the standard draw brush more and more, um, I don't know, it's, it seems a bit harsh to me, and I don't use it for a lot of stuff. Um, I'm using it a bit more. Uh, the thing that I like about the clay strips brush is it basically gives you natural tool marks um, just due to the nature of it being a, you know, it since it's flat and like most other brushes do, or at least not to the same degree, it gives you tool markings of sorts, which um, can, even though it seems counterintuitive, can yield a really nice touch to your model. Basically, it's surface treatment um, and works really well for that kind of thing. And here, I was starting to get a little too pulled into the detail because I started, basically, I, I saw too small of polys, and so I started thinking, oh, that'd be nice to detail that, and I shouldn't do that. Sucked into like the details. Right now, like his jawbone is all sorts of wonky, um, and so just quickly kind of pulling that in can help a lot. No, and this uh, is where it's really good, by the way, to have a skull just sitting on your desk because you can say, you know, because you'll, you'll start sculpting, you'll be sculpting, you'll be sculpting, and you think, hey, I know exactly how this face is structured. I know exactly what I'm doing. And then you zoom out and say, what the heck did I just make? And so having, having a you know, real-world reference right next to you to look at at any point, you know, just be able to pick it up, turn it around in your hand, is really, really beneficial, no matter how good you know your anatomy. The uh, next question is, do you sculpt the facial expressions, smile, sad, etc., at the beginning, or as you said earlier, you show it at the end of the sculpt? If it is at the end of your sculpt, do you, uh, basically, do you rig your portrait to then, you know, create the smiles? Uh, it depends on what my end result is. For, for these portraits that I've been doing as, you know, the, the sculpting exercise, I, I sculpt them directly in. But basically, I will take the sculpt to about right here, you know, not much further, just just as soon as I'm happy with the overall structure, you know, the facial structure and things like that, uh, that's when I will start basically hard coding things. Uh, and what I mean by that is I will turn, I will uh, turn off symmetry, I will pose the model, and then I will start adding in asymmetry, which is a really good time to also uh, start doing uh, details, like specific details, you know, whether that's your your facial features, your expressions, whatever. And so actually, uh, this is probably a really good time to do that because, I mean, I can sit here and do this all day long, 
Uh, so why don't we, now that we've got this sort of coming along. The other thing, um, I hope this is obvious, but if it's not, and if it's not, you know, don't feel stupid if you haven't been doing this, but always sculpt in perspective mode. If you sculpt in orthographic, so like, for example, if I go like this, you see things look all sorts of wonky. You might say, hey, wow, the head is really wide, or the jawbone's really, really wide. So I'm going to make that skinnier, that skinnier. You know, I'm going to pull this in, do all sorts of things like that. And then you switch back to perspective, and you're like, wow, my head is freaky thin. Because due to the perspective, if you're sculpting in orthographic, everything is going to seem thin. When you switch perspective, it seems thinner. When in reality, since we see everything with perspective, with depth and things like that, if you're not sculpting in, in it, you're basically trying to fake re, fake reality when you're not looking at it in a real sense. Uh, so be sculpting in perspective. It's okay to fix things in orthographic. You know, like if you go in, you got like you just want to focus really cleanly on the corner of the mouth. If your form is already there, if you're not changing the form, sure, do it in orthographic. That's fine. Um, but okay, so, oh, go ahead, Wes. Yeah, there's another uh, question. I'm, I don't know if I'm pronouncing this right. What do you think about using the Laplacian deform in order to change the pose to a model oh. made with I don't... Uh Actually, that's a really good question. Let's actually do that. So that is a new modifier in 2.7, I believe. Um, basically, what it allows us to do is quickly pose a mesh based on essentially hooks. So in this case, since I've already got the eyeballs, what I'm going to first do is I'm going to take my eyeballs. I'm going to subdivide or apply the modifiers on them, and then I'm going to quickly boolean the two just to join them together. Uh, just because since I'm working with dynamic topology, I want a single mesh, and so this way I will be able to pose both of them. So now I'll just quickly apply that. So now I've got just a single mesh for both of them, uh, which when working in dynamic topology works great. So basically, the Laplacian deform is actually really nice for this kind of thing. Uh, the main thing to note is that it doesn't work with super high-res meshes. So if you're going to use it, you have to use it early on in your process. So basically what it allows us to do is you can set an anchor vertex group. And so in this case, let's say like if I want to tilt his head a little bit to the side, um, you know, just give it a little bit off kilter just to bring a sense of reality to it. Because very seldom, you know, unless you're like a Buckingham Palace soldier, very seldom do you stand perfectly erect, perfectly straight. You know, so get, you know, putting a little off kilter can make all the difference in the world and making it feel natural. So what you can do is you just go into edit mode, just say select some vertices. It doesn't really matter which ones, just basically in this case the base. So I might do something like this. I will just hit control G, which allows me to assign them to a new group. And then I can select that group from my modifier and click bind. And it did not find a solution. And this is what happens when you use uh, high res meshes and such. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm probably going to fail here because I never actually use this. Yeah. Uh, yeah I was going to say, if, uh, even gonna say. Kind of say kudos at the bar. If you guys go to blendernation.com right now, uh, directly to the right of the live stream, there is a video tutorial on this very modifier. There you go. That's, that's the way to do it because I don't actually... So I generally use a lattice. Um, so I know that the Laplacian deform works really well. You just got to know the specifics of it. But so that I don't spend a lot of time just trying to figure it out during a live stream, I'm going to use a lattice. So basically, I take a lattice. I encompass my object by scaling it in object mode. And then I go over to the lattice data and just boost up the number of vertical cuts along the W axis. Um, and mostly, I want to make sure that I have a cut below the jawbone and several across the neck. So I might put in one more, just basically because anything, you know, like if I then go into edit mode and I select these ones and I deform this, anything within this is going to be continuously deformed. And anything between here and these next ones, right here, this one and this one, that's then just going to basically become a smooth bend depending on how I rotate this. So what I can do is now I just grab my object, go to the modifiers, add a modifier, I choose lattice, choose the lattice exact, and then go into edit mode, and now this just allows me to bend this really quickly. So then, you know, you don't really care about it being specific, um, and it's okay if things distort, because that's why we, you know, we focus on just the basics early on and the forms, because it's okay to break the forms. You know, basically expect to break the forms. Uh, 
you know, if I had a photo reference up, this would be easier to get a specific pose, but let's just, you know, maybe... Yeah, that's not too bad. I might turn on... A lot of times what I'll do to get rid of things like the lattice or the grid lines, which are distracting my, you know, the compositional composition and such, I might just quickly turn on only render so I can quickly see it without any extras. And, yeah, actually, that looks... That'll work pretty well. So then what I do is you can either just leave this and go into sculpt mode and sculpt on it like this, or generally I will just apply this, go back into sculpt mode, and first things first, enable dynamic again. And yes, I'll lose, lose vertex colors and such. That's fine. And then under the symmetry panel right here, I will turn off the X symmetry. And now sculpt everything without symmetry. So this means that you know when I'm going, I sculpt the nostrils. You know, you've got to do it on both sides. So this is more work, but you it's great, great practice for one, because suddenly you have to sculpt both sides. Uh, but you also get much better practice at basically placing your, your details in 3D space. Because when, when I only have to focus on one side, I just know that the other side is good. But suddenly, if I have to go around to the other side too, and you know maybe I add it right here, suddenly I realize, hey, my nose is all sorts of off kilter. Or, wow, that's not placed nearly in the right position. And so it's, it's just nice extra practice because it encourages you to look at everything not only more carefully, but, you know, in the bigger picture, basically. Now, there's just been uh, a couple, uh, one uh, comment from Bernardo is just saying, thanks for uh, all the work on the Mastering Modeling Workshop. It's been amazing how much you've learned from it. Love your work. Oh, that's fantastic. Thank you so much. Pretty awesome. And then uh, another question, I guess, you could say is, do you often finish your speed sculpts later, or do you usually mainly use these as exercises? Um, I'm doing two things. So first of all, I'm trying to mostly use it as an exercise. So you know that's why I say I'm not looking for a finished sculpt. You'll actually see that on my very first one, I spent like two hours rendering it, even though the render looks not good. Um, I spent a long time you know, setting up some lighting and rendering it and messing with shaders. And then in all my later ones, you, basically you'll start to see that I do progressively less and less rendering. And by, you know, by the third one, I think I'm not doing any. I'm just using um, a matte cap here in the 3D view, you know, matte cap and do something like, like this. And I'm only using that. The reason being is that I'm trying to just use it as a, a sculpting exercise and not anything else. So I'm not you know, trying to perfect my lighting. I'm not trying to perfect my shader work. Um, for one, I'm never going to be able to compete with Kent on that regard because the dude is amazing. Um, <laughs> I don't know how he does it. But, no, so I'm trying to just focus on the sculpting. And I'm also not spending much time finishing them after the fact. So, you know, I'm, I'm most two hours on each one, some of them a little bit more, and only on a couple of them have I come back and done more, you know, say the next day or something. I'm actually trying to avoid doing that because, again, one of the points of the entire exercise is to just get me sculpting again. You know, it's not about creating great work. It's not about creating finished pieces. It's merely about sculpting and, and sculpting practice particularly. Now, have you, um, another question, have you ever tried to sculpt a whole character, uh, not just a portrait? If you have, uh, each, do you model each part separately or the whole character at once? Uh, yeah, I mean, I've, I've definitely done complete characters. Um, I mean, if you look at my, my introduction to character modeling course, you know, I did the whole thing in that. Um, I, I generally break it apart into a couple pieces. So a lot of times, like, if I'm doing a complete character with a lot of detail, um, I might do that and the body as another piece. Uh, the reason being just that it allows me to uh, add, basically add more detail to the head rather than the body without worrying about, you know, blowing up my computer. Um, but it kind of depends on what I'm doing and at what stage I'm at while doing it. So, for example, like, if I'm doing it on this guy, you know, I might go ahead and do the entire body because I'm not making him super high res. Uh, you know, it's staying relatively basic. If I'm doing a super polished finished character, then I'll generally do it in two pieces. Uh, and then clothing and things like that will also be independent pieces. It gives you a better, uh, gives you more flexibility, you know, because like if you decide, hey, I really like the body, but I hate the head, it's, it's just easier 
to strip out the head and, and redo it if it's not already attached. You know, if it is attached, it's not a big deal. You know, there's, of course, all kinds of ways to do that, but it's easier if they're separate. Uh, and making them, like, merge together nicely is not a big deal at all. Like, it's actually quite simple, particularly with dynamic topology. You know, the dynamic topology mesh will not be the final sculpt. You know, if, say, like, if, if this were a character for a film, and we're going to take it all the way through to completion and make a nice animation-friendly model. You know, the, the dynamic topology would be nothing more than the exploratory portion of the sculpt. You know, after getting all the details down, then I would retopologize the mesh. I would, you know, scrap the dynamic topology version entirely. Well, no, I mean, I wouldn't scrap it, but I would no longer be using it. And then I'd probably do a detail pass within the sculpt uh, using multi-res or textures or something like that. And so here you can start to see, like, since it's posed, you know, I, I really have to focus on all angles, and I have to do them individually. But you also notice one thing <laughs> is that we're already more life in the character, and this is not because of the details. You know, yeah, the details help. You know, it helps that his lips are a little more defined. It helps that we're starting to get some better planes in the face. You know, we've got these nicely defined cheekbones. We've got a defined brow here. You know, I did add in the eyebrows. The eyebrows are actually something that I really like to add in relatively early on because people look weird without eyebrows. You know, that's just all there is to it. And so just adding that subtle indication suddenly can really help you place the eyes and say, you know, help the eyes look, not only look natural, but also basically ensure that they're in the right place. Yeah, the, uh, there's another question that I think uh, I'll take on. Is the, are there any chances uh, that we could see Kent Trammell on live stream? And... Mm -hmm. uh, that's a, yeah, I right, really hope so. See how much uh, convincing we can do with Mr. Kent. But uh, yeah, every two weeks on Sculpt Cookie, we're hoping to do these live streams, sort of, you know, relax Q and A with with an artist. And I believe the the next artist that we have lined up will be Josh Robinson. And uh, he's amazing, by the way. If you haven't been watching his work. Yeah, Josh just finished up on. Uh, Godzilla and uh, is now working on the next two Hunger Games, but uh, he's hopefully going to be with us in two weeks from now on the next live stream, and then we'll, we'll keep on trying to mix it up. We'll, we'll bring uh, you know visual effects artists to sculptors to traditional sculptors, and uh, you know, keep an interesting. If there's people you'd like to see, let us know. We'll try to get them. All right, guys. Just to let you know we have about ten minutes left of the live stream. So if you have any uh, questions that you would like to see answered, be sure to vote them up on the right-hand side or get them in. And this will be recorded and post it on sculptcookie.com, you know, probably a few hours after the stream. Here's an, uh, another question. Hey, when Retopo begins, if the goal is photorealism or like the Blizzard movies, how dense would the topology have to be for a whole character? A lot more sparse than you'd think. Um, you know, we... The nice thing about, like, where, like, modeling and such has gone is, you know, we we have the ability to use much more high-resolution meshes, you know, than, than ever before, you know, both in games and film and everything like that. And they do get quite high-resolution, you know, 14, 20, 30, 60, you know, 100,000 polys in the real-time model or even, you know, in the film model and whatnot. But the other thing, you know, to not discount is how much detail and, you know, fine things like that are are in the textures. Um, and not just, you know, just in the color and things like that, but also in the bump map, in the displacement map. You know, a lot of that kind of stuff is handled in, in the textures. And so what you might do, for example, if you've got a really high-res character, you uh, is you might have, you know, all of your your major, major detail, you know, things like the muscle structures and all of that kind of stuff directly in the in the model, and then have your, you know, like skin imperfections and things like that all in the the bump map. Now generally, or probably the displacement map more like, um, generally those things will will all be sculpted at some point or another. You know, so you might actually sculpt them, whether either via texture sculpting or actually through geometry, um, but they may not actually be in the final animated model. 
Uh, and so actually, if you look at like a lot of Pixar's models for like you know Monsters University and things like that, the actual model that gets animated is far simpler than you might think. Uh, because, you know, for the deformation, you don't need nearly as much as you do, say, to, like, give off the impression of skin pores. Uh, and so, yeah, you know, if you're going photorealism, you know, as to what that exact, you know, poly count is, well, who knows, you know, it doesn't really matter, because uh, it's, you know, it's all dependent on what your exact needs are and what the engine or movie animation can handle and whatnot. I don't know if that really answered the question, but... Yeah, I think it did. Yeah, I mean, basically, you I mean it's such a an hard thing to answer remotely if you don't, as, as Jonathan was mentioning, if you don't know those defined metrics of the environment that it's going into, whether that's the engine platform or even just rendering budget. Do you have uh, enough time to render this res? And if is, is it even in camera? And uh, next question: Do you print some of your models in three D? Is there some special <laughs> rule to follow in the in case to obtain a good result. Yeah, uh, actually, I have been um, printing them more and more. Uh, in fact, one of the things that I want to do with this portrait project is actually I want to print, once I'm done, I want to print all 30 of the portraits all in the same size. Um, I've got a, uh, a Form 1, which is a, an SLA printer in my studio, and so I'm able to actually directly, you know, so like I've actually printed two of them so far, um, I, I don't remember the exact numbers. Uh, I think it's. I think I printed number three, the the guy with the big beard, and then I've printed. I think it's number six. You know, I don't. I'm, I'm starting to lose track of which one's which. Um, and so the goal actually is to print all of them and be able to hold them and look at you know them physically to compare not only you know the imperfections and what's wrong with them, but also you know be able to physically see in a line in the real world the progression from start to end. As far as like special techniques to, you know, or things that you have to watch out for and pay attention, uh, the, the biggest thing is just that you need a non-manifold mesh. So you can't have any holes within your mesh. You can't have any open edges or anything like that. Uh, preparing for 3D printing in most cases is not an issue at all. It's, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, once you start getting more and more complicated, it can, of course, you know, become progressively more difficult. But no, it's really not too bad. Uh, and if you're sculpting in dynamic topology, you know, you have you well, you don't have to, but you really want a closed mesh anyway. And so it's you know, it kind of actually yields itself quite nicely to uh, to printing. Yeah, so I'm, uh, inquiring minds would like to know what. Uh, you are your approximate system specs that they're you're sculpting in? Uh, well, right now I'm sculpting on the uh, the new, I guess it'd be 2013 Mac Pro, the the Vader tube or the trash can, as some people like to call it. Um, the exact specs, uh, I can just tell you real quick. I'm not good at remembering that kind of thing. Uh, it is a 3.5 gigahertz six-core Intel Xeon E5 which doesn't mean a whole lot to me. Uh, and it's a it's got 16 gigs of, of DDR3 RAM. And then the, the video card, it's two Fire Pro 600s, I believe. Now, the video card really has very little effect when you're sculpting, though. You know, it's basically all in the CPU and your RAM. Now, do you have any uh, other types of objects you prefer to sculpt other than portraits? Um, not really, actually. You know, I, I, I love sculpting about anything, but portraits are what I really enjoy sculpting. Um, it, I, and I've always enjoyed it. You know, I think, you know, even when I was starting starting modeling in uh, before high school even, you know, heads were what I modeled. I mean, that's how I got my start teaching as well and training was doing the original uh, Blender head modeling tutorial. Uh, way back in the day. <laughs> way, yeah, way back. Uh <laughs> It's certainly gotten a lot easier to do it in Blender now. Well, and, and just in three, you know, CG in general, you know. Now, would you recommend portraits kind of being the, you know, the hello world type of thing to for a new sculptor to try? No, no not at all, actually. Um, I mean, that's not to say that you shouldn't, but the main thing is, well, okay, I kind of take that back. Um, it, it's a great thing to try because it's something that we stare at every single day. The The... 
reason that I would say no if you're a new sculptor and and this is assuming that you're also new to drawing you're you basically you're new to the art of the human form in general um, it's a great thing to try because it is something that we stare at every single day but it's also very difficult and it's very very daunting so so long as you are really persistent which I mean if you're learning a new craft you've got to be so if you're not persistent work on that um, it, it you know, I was going to say that it's not a good thing to start out with just because of its complexity, you know, particularly with human anatomy and things like that. But at the same time, I don't know that there's anything better either. So Yeah, is it a cue to be, you know, to work through any discouragement that the new sculptor might feel of not being yeah. able to sculpt the perfect head, you know, on, on the, the first go? I think, I think what I would say is absolutely it is a great thing to do. Just know that it's going to look like crap for... <laughs> Quite a while, <laughs> uh, and you know that goes with with everything. Whether you are oh, drawing, yeah, you start heads. somewhere. Exactly. Whether you're drawing heads, whether you are sculpting them, uh, whether you are modeling cars, you know, go look at you know, you know. Well, I guess, I don't think I have any, but my first car models, at anyone's first car models, uh, you know, basically their first anything. Like it's you know, unless you're a savant at what you do, it's going to look like crap for quite a while probably. Mm -hmm. and, and that's totally okay. Uh, you know, the main thing is don't get discouraged. And that's one of the things that I actually have been really enjoying about this exercise is because I was really frustrated with where my sculpting level was. You know, I felt comfortable with the tools, but I didn't feel comfortable with the results. You know, I didn't like it. I kept getting discouraged with the results that I was producing. Um, and so I, I, I basically stopped doing it. You know, I, I stopped sculpting so much because I didn't like what I was creating and I, you know, I, I was feeling incompetent, basically. And so by doing this, though, what's amazing is after just, you know, after seven sculpts, the difference, and you can just you go look at the Sculpt Cookie Gallery, the difference between, you know, quote, unquote, day one and day seven or even day, even day three, like, it's dramatic. And that's the main thing, you know, when you're when you're learning something like sculpting or any kind of new craft, be sure to go back and look at the work you did last week or last month. Because as long as you're keeping at it, the difference that you see in your work is going to be astounding. And, you know, that alone is a great motivator to keep doing things. Yeah, I think it speaks a little bit to more to, you know, sharing your work or putting your work out there to get the critique. You know, like with all those images on the gallery, it was really cool because I think when you first started this, you know, there, there weren't too many uh, others obviously doing it. And then I think now we have like five or six individuals that are taking on the portrait challenge. And it's really neat just to see some of the evolution already from those students. Uh, oh, it's you know, really cool. Day six, day seven, and, and seeing how it's changing. Well, cool. We have about uh, one minute left. I'll do one last question. Uh, is it possible to somehow paint texture on a sculpted model? Uh, you can paint vertex colors. So if you go in, so if we take, uh, let me save this real quick. Um, so what you can do if you go into vertex paint mode, we start just painting on it like this. Uh, main thing to note is it's really slow. Um, tell Blender's viewport gets updated, which is in progress. Uh, it'll probably happen in maybe in Blender 2.73 or 2.74, hopefully. Um, basically, until we get things like p and basically just better viewport for performance, it's really slow and admittedly not worth using unless you're working on a really simple model. Um, so, yeah. We, you know, right now, if your your best bet, if you want to texture a sculpt, your best bet is to quickly retopologize it, generate a displacement map so that you don't have to worry about having a really fine retopo retopology level, uh, and then paint the retopologize model, and then render that with a displacement map, and that'll work really well. Cool. Great. All right, guys. Well, I think that'll wrap up uh, this, this live stream. I appreciate everyone hanging out. There's still a lot of questions left. I know a couple of them were on, you know, the viewport angle, which was mentioned at the beginning of the video, and some of the comparisons with Mudbox and ZBrush that was also mentioned at the cool. beginning of the video, um, which will be live on the site here shortly. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll also just add, um, for one, thanks, everyone, for watching. It was a lot of fun. Uh, it was fun sculpting and good, good 
made sure that I actually got a portrait sculpted today because yeah, so you did you finished that's good. I and and I will actually you know consider this as one of one of the days in the challenge. Uh, but also, if you have any additional questions, you know, do feel free to ping me on Twitter with them. Uh, it's at Carter2422. Uh, you can, of course, also, once the live stream is posted on Sculpt Cookie, you can post the questions there in the comments, or you can also ping Sculpt Cookie on Twitter if you want to get feedback from other authors as well. So thanks again for watching, everyone. It was a lot of fun. All right. Thanks, guys.